What's good? It's Wug. We are going to get into Van Morrison, one of the most remarkable singer-songwriters, I would say, of the 60s, certainly, 70s, absolutely, and then into the 80s, 90s. Very prolific artist who is known primarily, I mean, he's got many reasons to be known and remembered and honored, but it is the single brown-eyed girl that you will still hear on oldies radio, on a commercial. It's one of those songs that is forever etched in the lexicon of rock and roll music, brown-eyed girl. And I want to talk a little bit about how Van Morrison got to the point of releasing such an immensely timeless single. And, you know, my favorite work of Van Morrison are his albums that follow, such as Astral Weeks and Moon Dance. And I'm going to get into those, especially in following videos. But you can't really discuss those just seminal albums, ridiculously good and varied and mysterious albums without going through the road to Brown Eyed Girl. It's just such a significant story in rock and roll. And Van Morrison, born in Belfast, Ireland. And so he was coming up at a time where his dad was in the shipping industry. So his dad would like go to Detroit from Ireland and he was an avid record collector. So as Van Morrison is growing up, he's listening to a bunch of like Lead Belly, John Coltrane, Ray Charles is one of his biggest influences, uh, gospel singer Mahalia Jackson, the Carter family. So, and, and I said Lead Belly, but I want to just re-emphasize Lead Belly because that might be the single most influential artist while Van Morrison was coming up. So he's basically just through osmosis, taking in all of the music that he's listening to. And, you know, then he himself starts getting into music. He starts learning to play the guitar, saxophone, and harmonica. So then in the 50s, you basically have this musical phenomenon known as skiffle. Skiffle is almost like a fast and kind of funny played, almost in like a yodeling style, a little bit of bluegrass, but it's like a fast, folky way of playing the blues. So you had Lonnie Donegan, who's probably the most uh, remembered skiffle player with the song Rock Island Line. Like you could look up Rock Island Line and you'll get a, uh, an idea of what skiffle is about. But this was like the huge craze as they were entering the mid 50s and so when that became the craze it's almost like Van Morrison already had like a head start to kind of get into what was already popping because they were basically repurposing like Lead Belly songs. I mean Lead Belly had a version of Rock Island Line recorded back in the 30s and so yeah it resurfaces in the mid 50s in the form of the skiffle music but yeah young Van Morrison was already up on that music and so yeah he pretty much became familiar with what was popping at the time and then after the skiffle craze kind of came and went on the other side of that came like the rock and roll that was you know uh, little richard elvis presley ray charles that whole movement led rock and roll towards the end of the 50s and then into the 60s and a few other Van Morrison, you know, huge, heavy influences, by the way, were like Muddy Waters. I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't say Solomon Burke, Hank Williams, uh, Jelly Roll Morton. Like, there was a lot of jazz in his dad's record collection, too. But, yeah, tons of blues, old country, folk. But, yeah, jazz as in Jelly Roll Morton. Like, you would hear the song, And It Stoned Me. Um, by Van Morrison years later, he even gives a shout out to Jelly Roll in that song. But yeah, you get into the 60s, after the 50s, into the mid-50s skiffle craze, which, by the way, Van Morrison actually had a skiffle band himself at the age of 12 called the Sputniks. So yeah, he was definitely getting involved in music at the time. But then you go into the 60s, and then he has other bands that he's, you know, learning to play with. And he started touring at, like, the age of 17 with his band, The Monarchs, that then became the International Monarchs once he started touring. And that was kind of the band that he really started cutting his teeth on tour with and kind of developing his stage persona. And then the Monarchs eventually broke up, and then he had a band for a time called the Golden Eagles, and then eventually had a band called Them. And you can't really discuss Van Morrison's mu musical career and legacy without talking about Them. So at this time, Van Morrison and his band Them are looking for a record label, and then they you know, eventually get a audition with Dick Rowe, who is kind of forever, unfortunately, known as the guy who passed on the Beatles, right? So Dick Rowe, kind of from like a, a sort of a bygone generation, and here comes Them into this audition, and you know, they had kind of like a intimidating, 
you know, the older people wouldn't have really got what was going on. Like, these guys were on the bleeding edge of what was next in rock and roll music, especially when you couple their instrumentation, which, again, Van Morrison, a lot of people don't know or don't remember, forgot that he is a multi-instrumentalist himself. Again, guitar, saxophone, harmonica. But him and his band, Them, they come in for the audition, and Van Morrison kind of has like this very raw, aggressive energy, kind of like a take no prisoner style to his stage persona. And a lot of people don't know how dynamic of a stage performer he was. So they're interviewing for Dick Rowe and, you know, Dick Rowe and them, they show supreme interest. And so they come out with their initial single as a band. And that song was called Don't Start Crying Now. It didn't do well. It was kind of like, it was almost more of like a throwback than it was a sign or indication of what was next. So what does Dick Rowe, you know, the person who's kind of managing the situation do? He hits up his boy, Burt Burns, an American, and a, I would say an esteemed American kind of budding hit maker. Like Burt Burns was pretty heavy at the time. He had already had, you know, big songs like, I mean, he did Twist and Shout for the Isley Brothers, then later famously covered by the Beatles. That was Burt Burns largely behind Twist and Shout. So yeah, he'd already had the reputation from that. He had uh, Under the Boardwalk by the Drifters, another smash. You could still listen to oldies radio in LA. It's K Earth 101, but you could just turn on oldies radio. Sometimes you will still hear Under the Boardwalk from 1964 by the Drifters. And then by like 1965, he would have I Want Candy, Hang On Sloopy. That's kind of like another famous oldie song, like one of those mid 60 songs. You could just listen, you know, Spotify the song. Hang on, Sloopy, Sloopy, hang on. It, big hit back in the day. So he did that. Um, in 1965, he did Baby, I'm Yours, uh, just a beautiful rock ballad by Barbara Lewis. So he did that one as well. And then a couple years later, he would do like Peace of My Heart, later covered by Janis Joplin. Um, he did that one in like 1967. So this is who Dick Rowe hits up to help this band clearly talented band, them. Burt Burns then comes from the States to the UK to produce the next few songs by them. And in those songs, they come up with their next single called Baby Please Don't Go. This ended up being the breakthrough hit that them needed. Baby, please don't go. It's like in that kind of classic R&B style. And again, when you're talking Van Morrison, he had like the unique ability. And I'm going to kind of get on a touchy sort of an edgy topic race in rock and roll at the time. But it was unusual that you had a white singer singing with the type of soul that Van Morrison naturally just had. Like sometimes you get it, right? Like uh, Elvis Presley, special, special voice. Uh, John Fogarty from Creedence Clearwater Revival, another example of that. Um, Paul Rogers, who was in that band Free, they sang uh, All Right Now. So you have different singers at different times who showcase a heightened level of soul, we'll call it. But yeah, Van Morrison was about as good as it gets when it comes to that quote-unquote blue-eyed soul. So people, if you weren't ready for it, you weren't ready for it. So Van Morrison, it's just jarring that how, how gravelly of a voice he has in a lot of these songs. So, yeah, baby, please don't go. That song worked. And it ended up hitting, like, the top 10 in the UK, singles-wise. So, they come out with that song, successful single. But it was actually the B-side to that successful baby, please don't go single that ended up being, like, their defining, definitive song. And that was Gloria, later covered by Patti Smith to kick off her, you know, her famous punk album, Horses, Gloria. And so them, again, Gloria was the B-side to Baby Please Don't Go. So when them would start doing their, you know, concerts, first in the UK, and then eventually they had a residency at the Whiskey, the Whiskey A Go-Go in Hollywood, California. And it was Gloria that ended up being their showstopper. They would always conclude their live show to Gloria. And it's been described like in their live performance of this song as like an incantation where it just swept the whole crowd and the way that the band would start building when, you know, Van Morrison is singing like, and then a G, L, and then he would just sing the individual letters, O and R. And I, and with a certain like inflection and a cert certain pronunciation that just worked, totally worked. By the time he would get to the G-L-O-R-I, Gloria, G, -I, 
Well, and then he would just totally get into it. And sometimes he would perform and them would perform that song Gloria to close the show. And they would do like a, a 15 minute performance of that song because of how many like crescendos that song can build into as it kind of whips the crowd up into a frenzy. It's reported that those shows I, in Belfast and in Ireland and in the UK, those shows around the time 1964, 1965 are still talked about to this day. That is how big of an impact them around that time had with Van Morrison's super riveting you know, live performances. And by the way, when they did the Whiskey A Go-Go touring those songs and including what their next single would be, Here Comes the Night, which is still Van Morrison's, you know, that's still his most successful chart topper. Like that hit number two in the UK, Here Comes the Night. Go listen to that song. That's one of, that's basically one of Van Morrison's biggest hits. So between Here Comes the Night, Baby Please Don't Go, Gloria, at some point, he even uh, recorded a version of I Put a Spell on You. That was, I forgot who did the original song. It was uh, like an old blues song. And then later covered by Nina Simone. And it was that Nina Simone cover that Van Morrison kind of emulates. And it's arguable who did it better, Nina Simone or Van Morrison. I mean, Van Morrison's version was that good to where you could even have that comparison. And so, again, when they did, when they went over to the States to do their one tour, because them would break up shortly thereafter. But when they did that U.S. tour with some of those songs, guess who was opening up for them at their whiskey residency? It was a young Doors band led by a young, or maybe led isn't the word. He was the most famous of the group. The other guys kind of had to reel Jim Morrison in. But yeah, basically from one Morrison to another when it comes to influence, Van Morrison heavily influenced Jim Morrison's stage persona. Just that no holds bar style, and even in the style of songwriting, like, and, and you know, Arthur Lee from the band Love was another huge influence on Jim Morrison and on The Doors. But Van Morrison, like the way that he would perform, just kind of like this brooding energy, and he would kind of get into even scat singing and kind of like poetry to a rhythmic, you know, to a rhythmic beat. And so he would be kind of, you know, walking, pacing the stage, just kind of acting like sort of disheveled, sort of stumbling as you're kind of like soulfully just barking out phrases that kind of go into these long run on sentences. This is basically as Van Morrison is crafting what would become his songwriting style for albums like the phenomenal Astral Weeks. So Jim Morrison is just soaking up game as he's, you know, participating towards the end of them's residency in Jim Morrison's hometown. Los Angeles, California. But again, after that whole kind of phase and era for them, 64, 65, the band broke up shortly thereafter. Van Morrison then goes back to, you know, Ireland, and he basically has to kind of start back at square one. He's now pursuing a solo career, and he's trying to get a label deal with this, you know, with a label called Phillips, but, you know, things are kind of taking a long time to drag out. Then he gets hit up by Burt Burns to the rescue once again, because again, Burt Burns was the guy who saved the day for the band them producing Baby Please Don't Go, Gloria, and the biggest hit, here comes the night. So Burt Burns hits Van Morrison up. Hey, come to the United States. Let's record some songs and get your solo career going. And Burt Burns at the time was starting his own label called Bang Records. And so he's basically looking for artists. He has another, you know, new up and coming artist at the time, Neil Diamond. Yeah, Burt Burns signed him too. So Van Morrison comes out to the States, starts recording again with Burt Burns, and they do a series of songs. One of those songs is Brown Eyed Girl. That was actually originally titled Brown Skin Girl. But this was basically Van Morrison trying to incorporate the different popular R&B rock and roll tropes at the time. And this also, you know, Brown Eyed Girl, or at the time Brown Skin Girl, but when it was released, Brown Eyed Girl, kind of gives an indication of how smart a songwriter Van Morrison is. He just knows how to hit that perfect mix. Like, it, like he's basically of the, of the ilk of, well, do I get to do my own thing or do you want to hit? And Van Morrison knows if you want to hit, I, you know, I know how to cook that up, especially when I'm working with somebody who's got the hit-making pedigree of Burt Burns. So they craft 
Brown Eyed Girl, one of the greatest rock and roll songs in the history of rock and roll. Like if you look at any one of those lists from like Rolling Stones, top whatever, you know, rock and roll hits to you name it, Brown Eyed Girl is going to be on that list. It's just one of those perfectly well-rounded, unforgettable, timeless is the word, timeless rock and roll classics. So that was kind of the culmination of that Van Morrison, Burt Burns combo. But in that same recording session, they had, as I said, they recorded a few other songs. One of them was called TB Sheets, by the way. Go YouTube and look up that song. That kind of gives like an idea of where Van was headed in his kind of off the wall, sort of, you know, metaphorical style of songwriting and just the amount of soul in that song, TB Sheets. That was not a single friendly type of song. That is a raw, emotional blues. Just, yeah, totally different type of song. But yeah, Brown Eyed Girl was one of the songs in that recording session, as were a bunch of other songs. But then Burt Burns, again, he's trying to get his label going. Unbeknownst to Van Morrison, Burt Burns, because this is now 1967, Summer of Love, Flower Power. This is the year of the Monterey Pop Festival up in Northern California. What I see as being kind of like the perfect storm, the the greatest moment, if you will, in that 67, that just that flower power, the hippie quote unquote era. That is where Jimi Hendrix burned his guitar. That is where the Who took the stage towards the end of the show, started smashing guitars. That is where Janis Joplin had her ball and chain performance with Big Brother and the Holding Company that got them signed to Clive Davis, one of the greatest, you know, one of the, probably one of the greatest and most significant live performances ever in terms of the impact. I mean, Janis Joplin killed Ball and Chain. You can look at that, that up on YouTube right now. That was the performance that won Clive Davis over. So Burt Burns taking this collection of songs with this vocal dynamo in Van Morrison, he's basically seeing dollar signs. And so he basically leverages the times, which is that 1967 Summer of Love, Jefferson Airplane, and you know, all of those types of bands. And he basically packages an album, again, without the you know consultation or Van Morrison even knowing about about it packages the songs to make an album he calls it uh, like blowing your mind or blow in your mind with the apostrophe instead of the G at the end of blowing so blowing your mind and he has kind of like a like a flower power psychedelic looking album cover just totally trying to play up the whole you know summer of love thing seeing an opportunity and just going for it packaging those songs Van Morrison was pissed. He found the, you know, the album artwork to be highly offensive. He thought that the, you know, the, the title was so opportunistic and the whole thing just, it wasn't what Van Morrison would have wanted, but it was what the guy kind of in charge, Burt Burns, who again, he's got financial incentive trying to get his label off the ground. He's just trying to, and he's not from, he being Burt Burns, isn't from what was becoming the album era. This is where you had, you know, Pet Sounds, uh, Sgt. Pepper's, uh, Revolver by the Beatles before Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and where the album as a as a whole was, was becoming something that was supposed to be, you know, greater than the sum of its parts, basically, like a concept album, if you will. Burt Burns wasn't from that era. He's from the hits era. Hits only hits. Just give me another hit and we'll just package a few other songs, slap a title on it. I mean, the title could be, you know, it could be anything like songs by, you know, name of the artist or, you know, more hits by the name of the artist. But they weren't looking at the album as a thing. So Burt Burns is just getting acclimated to this new musical climate. And again, he's being opportunistic, puts those Van Morrison songs, Brown Eyed Girl, TV Sheets, and the other songs that they recorded and packaged it as that Blowing Your Mind album. And that basically was the beginning of the end of the relationship between Van Morrison and Burt Burns. And Burt Burns unexpectedly died shortly thereafter. So Van Morrison also didn't know what he totally what he was signing to record contract wise. I guess it's reported or through interviews that he didn't, you know, he didn't go through all of the language of the contract. So there ended up being a big record uh, contract dispute that he basically stopped recording for the uh, for the label, even though to get out of the label, he would eventually record a mandated 30 songs, which were just total like fluff songs, like singing about like, you know, a uh, ringworm and stuff like that. Just putting together like 30 songs as quickly as you can just to get the hell out of the contract. But that record label dispute kept uh, Van Morrison from being able to record 
in the UK for like a period of time. So his career was on pause. And again, Burt Burns passed away and his career would later resurface with Astro Weeks. And we'll stop there. But that was basically the road up to Brown Eyed Girl and then the disillusion of Van Morrison's musical relationship with Burt Burns, who again, passed away due, due to a heart attack shortly thereafter. And boy, would his career recover. Like, yeah, because he went, he basically had to go home. He was, he was broke and without a plan at that point. So he just kept on writing songs. And again, the next album after Blowing Your Mind that he would release would be, to me, his strongest musical statement in his entire solo discography, Astro Weeks. I, I still can't wrap, wrap my head around the beauty and the how enchanting and just the mystique of that album. It's truly phenomenal. Give that album a listen. But yeah, that is basically the story of Van Morrison, Burt Burns, and Brown Eyed Girl. Let me know if you are up on Van Morrison's music. If you are, what is your favorite album or what are your favorite few Van Morrison songs? Please let me know in the comments. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you love music like I do. I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.